quorum's present. Okay, so I shall go back and just repeat Senator McKim. Okay. Uh, so I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 32 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that letter from Senator McKim proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is that proposal supported? Wow. Yes, okay. It's supported. Thank you. Okay. I understand the informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator McKim. Thank well, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. There is nothing short of a full-blown rental crisis happening right now in Australia. And in my home state of Tasmania, since 2016, the median rental rate in Hobart, where I live, has grown by 50 per cent. That is 50 per cent in six years. It is absolutely critical that we address this crisis in rental affordability and in housing more broadly, where if you're lucky enough to be able to rent a place, so many people can't afford to pay their rent and so many people can't even find a place to rent because vacancy rates are too low. The explosion in rental costs and the ensuing rental crisis represents a massive transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich and, in general terms, from the young to the older. And it's not by accident and it's not just bad luck by the tenants. This has been done and driven deliberately by successive Liberal and Labor governments because the class war by property owners and the banks has been going on for a long time, and make no mistake, the tenants are losing the war. The Labor Party and the Liberal Party have backed in landlords and they've backed in the banks and they've backed them in to continue to make massive profits. And they've done that by ensuring that the return for the banks and the return for the landlords is guaranteed by the taxpayer. The great Australian dream is no longer that you can one day own a home of your own. The great Australian dream today is owning a property portfolio with tenants who pay your income and who pay ultimately for your assets. So if you own a house and it's rented out, even though you might be renting it out for a loss, that loss is subsidised through tax breaks for you, paid for by the taxpayers. And what that means, tragically, is that not only do tenants pay off their landlord's mortgage, they pay the tax that the landlords don't. And on what planet is that fair or reasonable? It is an absolute scam. And the scammers are the parties, the political parties in this place, that deliver on those tax breaks. In real terms, what that means for people on the ground is they're skipping meals, they're not paying their power bills, they're not paying for much needed medicine just to keep a roof over their heads. In a country where a landlord can own 283 rental properties and still complain about the prospect of a freeze in rents, this is an absolute obscenity. Enough is enough. It's time to cap rents, and we should do it for two years, then we should peg them to the CPI thereafter. And that is just the start. We've, we should scrap the capital gains tax discount, we should end negative gearing, and we should actually start building enough homes so that everyone can have a home to live in. And most importantly, we need to shatter the class gap between those who own housing and those who don't. Senator McKim, Senator Walsh. 
Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the motion moved by Senator McKim. Uh, the Albanese government recognises the challenges that Australians are facing um, because we talk to them every day. So we know families are struggling with a decade of low wages growth, cost of living pressures and rental affordability. The private rental market has been put under significant pressure as a result of strong numbers of people moving within states between towns and cities and people moving across state lines, putting pressure on particular rental markets. Uh, and also putting pr pressure on rental markets has been shrinking household sizes, um, which uh, in turn puts pressure on the supply of private rentals. Um, major cities and regional towns are experiencing low vacancy rates and really fast-growing rental prices. Uh, and this is forcing Australians into insecure housing arrangements like caravan parks and other temporary solutions. Uh, in, a, in a wealthy country like Australia, this is just not acceptable. We do understand how tough it is for Australian households. We know that long waiting lists for social housing are forcing vulnerable Australians into the private rental market. And we know that more Australians are being forced to rent because they've been unable to buy their own home as well, uh, which is why our ambitious housing reform agenda is working to address the underlying causes of housing unaffordability using the levers that we do have as a federal government available to us to get more Australians into affordable homes. Uh, but these challenges that we face today, of course, have not come on uh, overnight. There have been very real challenges for the past 10 years, challenges that the former government took absolutely no interest in addressing. Um, those opposite oversaw shamefully low numbers of new social housing builds uh, when they were in government. By 2020, seven years into their term, they had only built 7,500 new dwellings. Um, compare that to the more than 30,000 new dwellings from the previous Labor government over a similar period of time. Um, but in their dying days, the coalition finally had uh, a light bulb moment on housing policy, uh, and they finally came up with one. Uh, that they said would address housing affordability and help people own their own home. Uh, and what was that solution? Um, of course, we will all remember that it was to force Australians to raid their own superannuation to be able to afford a house deposit, a policy that would have driven up property prices even further and left Australians with higher debt and depleted, and depleted workers' retirement savings. Why? does the coalition hate superannuation? Why do they hate it so much? Leaving even more Australians without financial security. <coughs> now, on the other hand, the Albanese government, we have a comprehensive plan to address the housing crisis, uh, and we are wasting no time getting on with it. We're establishing the Housing Australia Future Fund, uh, investing $10 billion to build 30,000 new social and affordable housing properties—30,000 new social and affordable housing properties. Um, that, of course, is going to get more people who need them into those homes, and it's also going to put downward pressure on rental prices uh, and help really vulnerable families um, access housing when they're fleeing family and domestic violence as well. Uh, in addition to that um, massive investment, unprecedented uh, $10 billion of federal investment in social and affordable housing, we're also unlocking up to half a billion dollars through the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to invest in even more social and affordable housing. Uh, and that is a move uh, that will encourage investors, um, such as super funds, to invest in projects that drive down housing prices, um, rather than gutting workers' retirement savings and driving house prices up. 
That's where we think the super funds can come into the housing uh, equation uh, in partnering with government to invest in projects that create more homes and drive down prices. Again, we think that's a better option than forcing people to raid their own super in a desperate attempt to be able to afford their own home while, of course, gutting their retirement savings and putting themselves in an even more vulnerable position uh, in the future. Our government is also helping Australians to enter the housing market and own their own home. We've brought forward the start of the regional first homebuyer guarantee to October 1, uh, and that will help up to 10,000 Australians purchase their first home. This joins the up to 50,000 Australians being assisted to buy their first home under the Home Guarantee Scheme. Uh, our government is also introducing the Help to Buy program. Uh, that is going to help uh, cut the cost of buying a home by up to 40 per cent, uh, making it easier uh, and cheaper for Australians to own their own home. Uh, and when it comes to rental affordability, uh, our government is stepping up uh, and we are bringing the states and the territories together, because uh, that's what we do. We work with the state governments and the territory governments. Uh, we bring them together with us to solve the big challenges that Australians face. So we're working with the state and territory housing ministers to explore uh, innovative solutions to address these housing challenges. We're addressing a new national uh, housing and homelessness plan, developing a new plan, uh, that will form a key part of our agenda. Uh, and we're introducing a National Housing Supply and Affordability Council to ensure the Commonwealth uh, is playing its role in increasing supply uh, and improving affordability. Our government is stepping up to bring new national leadership on housing, uh, national leadership that was sorely missing under the previous government, because while we recognise that some of the levers to fix these problems sit with state uh, and territory governments, we also recognise that the previous government simply was missing in action on this question. Now we know the security that housing can bring to Australian workers, and we also know that one of the key barriers to accessing housing um, is insecure work. And the crisis of insecure work is a legacy of those opposite, one that they have absolutely refused to admit in their 10 years in government, one that they refuse to admit even exists. Um, coalition senators have said, uh, and I quote, that insecure work is a labour lie. Uh, it's a labour lie. Um, one of their ministers earlier this year called job insecurity made-up issues. So labour lies uh, and made-up issues, um, despite the evidence right in front of them, including evidence about the links between insecure work and housing insecurity as well, uh, and despite what they themselves were hearing from workers, um, workers that came and told their stories to the job security inquiry uh, led by my colleague Tony Sheldon, for example. Stories of low pay, stories of low irregular hours, stories of having no ability to provide stable income on a rental application. People who are working and having to live in caravan parks because they can't get enough secure hours to actually fill out a successful rental application. So fixing the crisis of insecure work, the very real crisis of insecure work, is part of our government's plan to give people security at work and also in housing. The legacy that those opposite left behind is a crisis of insecure work, a decade of low wages growth and nothing nothing at all to help Australians afford a home. We know the importance of good, secure jobs. We know they're a gateway to good, secure lives. We know that they're a gateway to good, secure housing as well. And we know what insecure work is doing to households and families. Uh, that's why we have a secure jobs plan, which is about giving workers permanency and security that they need to, to plan for their future. We'll make secure work an objective of the Fair Work Act, making sure that the Fair Work Commission puts job security at the heart of its decision making. Uh, and we're introducing a secure jobs code 
to ensure that taxpayer money spent through government contracts is being used to support secure employment too, because we know people need secure jobs and secure houses. Our government takes these housing challenges very seriously. We're getting on with delivering answers to them. Uh, we know that having a good job is critical to good housing. We know we can't require the state and territory governments to freeze rents like the Greens want us to, or uh, we know we can't force Australians to raid their retirement savings like Time those opposite want us expired. to as well. Senator Scar. I thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In speaking on this urgency motion, I'd first like to address some of the comments made by Senator Walsh. Uh, whose thoughts and views I, uh, I deeply respect. Uh, but there are three uh, points I'd like to make with respect to Senator Walsh's con contribution. First, in relation to the coalition's policy that it went into the last election with, the policy was to give superannuation fund holders, especially the young, the choice. The choice. It wasn't a question of forcing, it was giving them the choice if they decided to take a certain amount out of their super, superannuation funds in order to get them into the housing market and buy their first home, their most important asset for the rest of their life. That's the first point. Second point, I believe in relation to the supply of housing we need to be more creative in terms of working with community organisations, being innovative. Social housing doesn't necessarily have to be owned by state governments or federal governments or whichever government, but be innovative and work with community organisations at the front line to try and get solutions for local communities. Some of the most passionate people in this space, as I'm sure everyone would agree, are those front line community organisations that are dealing with this issue every single day. And the third point I'd like to make in relation to Senator Walsh's comments is the question supply. Supply, supply, supply. We need more supply for people who are seeking to rent accommodation. That's the question. We need supply. And green tape and red tape is frustrating supply. And I see it where my office is located, in Springfield, southwest growth corridor of Queensland, the fastest growing region in Queensland, where the people who want to construct housing uh, for new home buyers, for others, for renters, etc., are being frustrated by the green tape and the red tape. We need supply. Now, dealing with Senator McKim's urgency motion, whenever the Greens Whenever the Greens put forward a motion dealing with economics, I always go to my library and I bring out my book on basic economics by Dr Thomas Sowell, and I see what my book on basic economics says by Dr Thomas Sowell, because that always provides the answers. And I only needed to go to page 45, page 45 of my book, Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, to learn that the history of uh, economics teaches us rent controls do not work. Rent controls do not work. They might, be, they might be proposed with the best of intentions. They might be proposed with the best of intentions, but what frequently happens when a policy is proposed with the best intentions, it actually hurts. It actually hurts those who it is intended to help. And that Order. is the case with respect to rent control. Now, Order. let me quote from page 43 of Thomas Sowell's book, Basic Economics. And that says, quote, nine years after the end of World War II, Order. not a single Senator, new building Senator, Senator had Scar, been built Senator in Scar. Melbourne, Australia. Senator, Senator Scar. Sorry, Senator Scar. Senator McKim, now I'm pretty relaxed on inter, you know, interjections, but I did ask you a number of times if you could just. OK? Let's, let's see there. Senator Scar, and you two can sort it out in the hallway after. Thank Senator you. Scar. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, for your usual firm hand in this place. I do appreciate it. Uh, let, me quote, let me quote from this book. Quote, Nine years after the end of World War II, not a single new building had been built in Melbourne. For nine years, not a single building, new building had, apartment building had been built in Melbourne because of rent control laws there which made buildings unprofitable. So that's what happened. They introduced rent control in Victoria at the time of World War II. Not a single new apartment building was built because it wasn't profitable to do so. That's what impacts supply. That's the impact on supply. And it wasn't just Victoria. How about Egypt? In Egypt, rent control was imposed in 1960. This isn't new. This isn't new. An Egyptian woman who lived through that era and wrote about it in 2006 reported, and I quote, 
The end result was that people stopped investing in apartment buildings, and a huge shortage in rentals and housing forced many Egyptians to live in horrible conditions, with several families sharing one small apartment." End quote. And it's not just Egypt. Let's go to England. In and I quote again from the book. This is page 45. In terms of incentives, it is likewise easy to understand what happened in England when rent control was extended in 1975 to cover furnished rental units. According to the Times of London, quote, advertisements for furnished rental accommodation in the London Evening Standard plummeted dramatically in the first week after the Act came into force and are now running at about 75 per cent below last year's levels." End quote. That's what happened in London in 1975. Let's go to Toronto. Let's go to another continent. We've been to Australia. We've been to Africa. We've been to Europe. Let's go to North America. This is what happened in Toronto. Within three years after rent control was imposed in Toronto in 1976, 23 per cent of all rental units in owner-occupied dwellings were withdrawn from the housing market." End quote. So that's what happened in North America. You don't have to have a PhD in, in economics like Dr Thomas Sow to work out that rent control does not work. It has never worked. And in fact, it actually hurts the people it's intended to help. And then what happens to these places? What happens in these places when they actually remove rent control? So let's take the corollary. What happens when you remove rent control and you let the market, you let the market act and people make their individual decisions? Again, I quote from page 47. In Massachusetts, a statewide ban on local rent control in 1994 led to the construction of new apartment buildings in some formerly rent controlled Massachusetts cities for the first time in 25 years. End quote. You ended rent control and you actually got new apartment buildings for the most vulnerable in society for the first time in 25 years when you removed rent control. That's basic, basic economics. Basic economics. We need more of that, more of basic economics. This isn't new, this stuff. You don't have to be John Maynard Keynes or Milton Friedman to get it. It's not new. It's not new. It's all there. And I'm happy to lend my copy to anyone in the Greens at any time. Just come around the office. I'll even buy you one. I'll buy you one. I, refer, I quote it so often to you, Senator McKim. I'll even buy you one. I'll buy you one. I'll buy you one. I'll get, a, I'll get 12 of them. And at the same time, I must say, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult to sit here and, and, and be lectured to by those opposites sitting in the Labor Party, coming from the home, my home state of Queensland, and I see what the Queensland government is doing. They're drinking the same Kool-Aid as the Greens in terms of this urgency resolution. And they have this ridiculous proposal at the moment with respect to land tax, where they want the land tax threshold for Queensland investors to take into account properties which are held in other states. That's absolutely crazy stuff. And what's the consequence? What happens when you change the tax system in this way? What happens when you introduce rent controls? Well, the investors leave. The landlords say it's too hard. If it's not going to be profitable for me, I'll go and invest my money somewhere else. That's what happens. It's basic economics. And that's what we're actually seeing in Queensland. And I want to take the opportunity, because I think it is relevant to this debate in relation to housing supply and what we need to do, to quote from an article by Neil Sweeney, reporter in the AFR, an article of September 25, 2022. And I quote, Queensland new land tax rule will not take effect until the middle of next year, but property investors Peter and Joanna Meek are not waiting around. They're not waiting around, they're selling up. And what do they say? We have three rental properties in Queensland. We've already sold one and we're in the process of selling another, Mr Meek said. We're planning to move into the last property as we're unable to find a decent rental. So that's three rentals off the market already, end quote. That's what they're doing. That's what those landlords are doing in response to Queensland Labor Palaszczuk government, their proposed land tax reforms. People are simply leaving the market. The landlords are leaving the market. I quote further from the article. SQM Research Managing Director Louis Christopher said the rental supply crunch would worsen as a result of the Queensland government's tenancy and tax reforms. I fear it will get worse for tenants as the scarce supply—scarce supply, supply and demand—that's what it's about. 
pushes rents higher, Mr Christopher said. But the proposed rental freeze and the new land tax rule will not solve the problem. It will only encourage landlords to walk away." End quote. And that's the problem. That's what basic economics tells you. That's what the experience from all over the world tells you. When you introduce things like rental freezes, when you introduce massive changes to land tax, when you introduce laws which make it more difficult for landlords to be flexible with respect to their investments, they walk away. And then the supply of rental properties decreases, the rents go up, and who's hurt the most vulnerable in our society? Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Speaking with people in our communities at the moment, or even picking up a newspaper, you would have to have your head buried deeply in the sand if you fail to recognize that housing affordability is absolutely top of mind for so many. And there is no surprise why. Rents have gone through the roof. Um, you know, the, the dream of owning your first home has become a real nightmare. Across the country, many areas have seen the steepest annual rent increases on record this year. In Sydney, where I live, the annual increase has been a whopping 19.6%. And a very grim tale is told in regional New South Wales as well, especially by those who have been so deeply affected by the climate-induced floods. The unfolding rental affordability crisis is destroying communities. A recent ABC article tells this story. Single mother Tilly Eastwood says the worst part of being priced out of the rental market isn't living in a garage with her three children. It isn't the absence of windows for light or fresh air. It's not even the 150 plus failed rental applications. It's the knowing feeling that she's letting down her kids. How is it that the Labour government is willing to give $244 billion for stage three tax cuts back into the pockets of the wealthiest and the billionaires, yet refuse to act for those who are struggling to keep a roof over their head. A very basic human right. We need a national rent freeze, and we need it now. It's beyond clear that with more and more people renting long term, people in our community of all ages, backgrounds, walks of life, desperately need relief from skyrocketing rents and poor tenancy protections. The federal government cannot just wash their hands off the responsibility of ensuring a home for everyone. It regularly plays a role in issues like industrial relations, energy and others, which would usually be left up to individual states and territories, so surely they can do the same for housing. A two-year rent freeze would be followed by ongoing rent caps and an end to no grounds evictions. Minimum standards for rental properties and giving tenants rights to make minor improvements to their homes, as well as having a right to have companion animals. The Greens have been fighting hard for rental affordability, renters' rights, and homes for all. Just a couple of examples are Jenny Leong, the Greens member for Newtown, who has been leading this work in the New South Wales Parliament. Earlier this year, Jenny introduced a private member's bill to introduce evictions bans and rent caps in flood-impacted areas in New South Wales as well as ending no grounds evictions and limiting rent increases for renters across New South Wales. Further north, the Greens MP for South Brisbane, Amy McMahon, has introduced a bill that would freeze rents for two years. In her second reading speech, Amy said that across Queensland, families are struggling to make ends meet with rising costs of rent, fuel and groceries, and it is hitting renters and first home buyers the hardest. Families are living in tents, because they cannot afford a secure, affordable home. This is an outrageous situation, and it requires decisive action, and it requires decisive action now to finally tackle this. The housing affordability crisis is harming too many people. We need a rent freeze right now. We need strong national renters' rights standards. We need to build a million publicly owned affordable homes and we need to end the tax loopholes for the richest in the country. Nobody, nobody should be without a home. Whether you own a home or rent, our housing system should work for people, not for profit. The government must make the choice of fixing this crisis. Senator Ricky, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Albanese government understands just how serious the current housing challenge is. We are committed to acting to address it. 
whereas the previous government made it very clear it would not take up the call for action. Unlike some in this place, we know there is no silver bullet to address this very serious problem, but Labor has an ambitious plan to tackle the housing challenge we inherited. We went into the May election with a comprehensive housing reform agenda and we're working hard to address the causes of Australia's rental affordability challenges. We recognise this is a very serious challenge occurring across the country, which is putting stress on a great many families and individuals. In Tasmania, rental, renters are experiencing these in increases just like the rest of the country. More and more people have been coming to my electorate office talking to me about the struggle of trying to find an affordable home. Cities and towns across our country are experiencing extremely low rental vacancy rates. Australians are being forced into insecure housing like caravans and tents. This is not an acceptable situation in a wealthy country such as ours, and the Albanese government is taking significant steps to address it. These rental and cost of living challenges are very real and they need real, lasting solutions. We are not, however, actively considering proposals to freeze rents. It is important to note that regulation of residential tenancies is a matter for state and territory governments. The Commonwealth cannot require those governments to freeze rents. But there are things we can do. And our government's housing reform agenda is working to address the causes of Australia's rental affordability challenges. We're moving to swiftly implement a comprehensive plan to address the rental crisis and to help those in the private rental market, a plan which was endorsed by the Australian people when they voted us into government this year. Social housing lists have grown to an unacceptable size over recent years. In my home state of Tasmania, government's own data shows that more than 4,450 families are now stuck on the government's historically unprecedented wait list as the state government fails to deliver on its big housing promises over many, many years. And these long waiting lists for social housing across the country have forced vulnerable Australians into the private rental market. To help address this, we've acted quickly by unlocking up to $575 million through the National Housing Infrastructure Facility to invest in more social and affordable housing. This will support our commitment to build 30,000 new social and affordable housing properties through the $10 billion Housing Australian Future Fund. This will put downward pressure on rental prices. We have uh, many Australians who are trapped in the rental market because they have been unable to buy their own home. In response to this, the Albanese government has brought forward the start of the regional first home buyer guarantee to October 1 this year, three months earlier than we promised. That initiative alone will help up to 10,000 regional Australians every year get into their first home with a, de with a deposit of as little as 5%. The government will guarantee up to 15 per cent of the purchase price for eligible first home buyers, meaning regional Australians looking to buy can avoid paying costly mortgage insurance. This is concrete action taken by our government to help Australians into a home. And it's targeted action, available only to locals who have been living in the region they want to buy in or a neighbouring regional area. To be eligible for a regional first home buyer guarantee, applicants must be Australian citizens, purchase outside a capital city and demonstrate they have been living in the region in which they are purchasing the property or, as I said, the adjacent regional area for at least 12 months. <coughs> this is in addition to the Home Guarantee Scheme, which helps up to 50,000 eligible Australians into home ownership every year. It supports first home buyers and single parents with dependents into home ownership with a smaller deposit. Under the first home guarantee, up to 15 per cent of an eligible first home buyer's home loan from a participating lender will be guaranteed. This enables the home buyer to purchase a home with as little as 5 per cent deposit without paying lender's mortgage insurance. The Family Home Guarantee supports single parents with dependents to own their own home with a minimum deposit of as little as 2 per cent. We will also introduce Help to Buy, a brand new program 
that will help cut the, cut the cost of buying a home by up to 40 per cent and make it cheaper and easier for eligible Australians to own their own home. It's important to recognise that many of the levers to fix rental affordability are in the hands of state and territory governments. And so, in a spirit of true collaboration and national leadership, our government has begun a process working with state and territory housing ministers to explore innovative approaches to address rental affordability. This reform agenda is so important to ensure that Australians are not denied that basic right of a roof over their heads will be in clear evidence in the upcoming budget with real commitments to put more downward pressure on rents. Unlike the previous government, we recognise that the Commonwealth has an important leadership role in increasing housing supply and improving affordability. We will establish a National Housing Supply and Affordability Council to ensure the Commonwealth plays that leadership role in increasing housing supply and improving affordability. The Council will be advised by experts from the sector. It will set targets for land supply in consultation with states and territories. It will also collect and make public data on housing supply, demand and affordability. Fixing land supply and planning will improve housing affordability and boost economic growth. But the only way to achieve this is by the three levels of government all working together. The Minister for Housing and Homelessness, the Hon. Julie Collins MP, has started the development of a new national housing and homelessness plan that will become a key plank in our reform agenda. This plan will be developed with the support and assistance of key stakeholders, including states and territories, local government, not-for-profits, urban development experts and industry bodies. It will set out the key reforms needed to make it easier for Australians to buy a home, easier to rent, <coughs> and put a roof over the heads of more homeless Australians. Organisations from all sides of the political spectrum have been calling for years for a plan like this, and the previous government ignored them. The Albanese government takes rental affordability challenges seriously. That's why we are delivering the regional first home buyer guarantee ahead of schedule, because we recognise the serious housing challenges in regional Australia. We inherited a housing affordability crisis and we are tackling it with a practical but ambitious plan. This challenge is one we will strive to address every day we are in government in this country. We know we have a lot of work ahead of us and this coming weekend the start of the regional first home buyer guarantee is that first step. Thanks, Senator <coughs> Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And it's, uh, I'm very pleased to rise to speak to this motion today, because let me tell you one of the reasons why I'm in the Liberal Party is that the Liberal Party actually believes in home ownership. So, while I'm speaking to the issue of freezing uh, rents, uh, I think the best way um, to get around this issue is to actually own your own house, uh, and that is why I'm in the Liberal Party. Uh, and um, I just want to quote from the speech, and it's often considered. Uh, the original uh, speech or the manifesto, if I can use that word for the Liberal Party, a bit of an oxymoron there, that statement. But anyway, um, it's interesting to note that Robert Menzies, in his Forgotten People speech, mentions the word home 23 times. He also says that the rich and powerful can look after themselves, and he also says that we should, know, should not go back to the old and selfish notions of laissez affair. Uh, capitalism, which I think a lot of people, if they'd actually read the Forgotten People speech, would be surprised by. And I'm happy to give anyone on the other side of the chamber that speech because you would see that it actually appeals to those people who just want to remain quiet in the suburbs, who don't need uh, you know, other people telling them what to do. They just want to be left alone in their house with their family and everyone else can get out of their lives. And I know I speak for many people who feel like that, and that is why I am in the Liberal Party. But I just want to quote. Uh, what homes mean to the Liberal Party uh, and a part of Robert Menzies' speech. Uh, first, it is, is he describes homes as having a stake in the country. It has responsibility for homes, homes material, homes human and homes spiritual. I do not believe that the real life of this nation is to be found in either great luxury hotels and the petty gossip of so-called fashionable suburbs. So he actually is not a big fan of the blowhards. I know a lot of people think the Liberal Party is the blowhard party, and I admit we do have blowhards and sometimes we tend to 
take their line, but we shouldn't do that. We are the party of battlers, and we've got to remember that. This country is all about wealth for toil, and it's founded by the battlers, not the blowhards, and we need to remember that. It is to be found in the homes of people who are nameless and, ad and unadvertised, and who, whatever their individual religion, a religious conviction or dogma, see in their children their greatest contribution to the immortality of their race. Exactly. Who doesn't love their children? The home is, to be, is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. Well, I can vouch for that. I have to admit, in my youth, I drank a lot of beer and when I bought a home. Uh, you know, it took a couple of years, but I slowly weaned myself off the bottle. Um, it is the indispensable condition of continuity. It health determines the health of a society it, as a whole. I have mentioned homes uh, material, homes human and homes spirit, spiritual. Let me take them in order. What do I mean by homes material? The material home represents the concrete expression of the habits of frugality and saving for a home of your own. Your advanced socialist may rave against private property even while he acquires it. Yep, good point there, pointing out the hypocrisy of some, some people that you know, think we should all own nothing, uh, but you know, meanwhile flying jets and everything like that. Uh, but one of the best instincts in us is that which induces us to have one little piece of earth with a house and a garden which is ours to which we can withdraw, in which we can be among, among our friends, into which no stranger may come against our will. If you consider it, you will see that, as in the old saying, the Englishman's home is his castle. It is this very fact that leads on to the conclusion that he who seeks to violate that law by violating the soil of England must be repelled and defeated. Don't uh, get too much on that stuff. National patriotism, in other words, inver inevitably springs from the instinct to defend and preserve our own homes. Well, so. Can I say, Senator McKim, I, I, I totally uh, think that we need to get people in houses. Um, I think home ownership, there's a lot to be said for home ownership. And I think one of the problems we've got with the rental market at the moment is that not enough people own their own homes. And I've often uh, ranted against the fact that when Keating uh, made a lot of amendments in the 80s, and as you well know, there was a lot of neoliberal stuff that was brought in in the 80s. One of the biggest mistakes that was made was that we didn't have capital gains tax on wealthy housing. I'm not against you know, the common man having a house, but you take, say, the 5 per cent, or you, know, you could start at 2.5 million or something, but there's a, a level above which you shouldn't have capital ta ta uh, gains tax-free housing because you've got multi-millionaires living in Bondi in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. They buy a house for $3 million, they sell it for $10 million, they clean up $7 million in profit and they don't pay a cent of tax. Meanwhile, you've got the battlers out there who get out of bed every morning, they put their nose to the grindstone and they will start paying tax above $18,200 at $0.19 cents, uh, in the dollar plus 2 per cent Medicare. They'll also lose $0.50 cents in the dollar if they're on, the, on um, New Start or Job Seeker or whatever it's called nowadays, um, and then they lose another 10.5 per cent super. So they actually end up losing between 20 and 30 grand. You end up losing 80 cents out of every dollar you earn, um, and that's completely absurd. So I, I think we should have a capital gains tax on housing, and actually then above two million or three million, somewhere between that range, and then basically use that to give a tax offset to the low-income earners uh, who struggle. Because basically, if you earn less than the cost of living, which let's say it's forty thousand dollars a year, uh, um, acting deputy speaker, you're actually losing money. So why do we tax people? below the cost of living. It is, it is complete nonsense. Um, so anyway, um, so I'm very passionate about home ownership. Now, wh while I know that your intention is good, we do have a bit of a problem at the moment because we've also got a, a very um, incompetent RBA that blew up the housing bubble uh, uh, throughout COVID, even though we already had a housing bubble before that. I should note that in 1985, we had $8 billion in foreign debt. Uh, and when uh, we opened up Keating opened up the economy to foreign banks. By 2008, we had $800 billion in foreign debt. That mean, and all of that money went into mainly the property market in Sydney and Melbourne, which meant that housing prices went from four times average earnings to 13 times average earnings. Right? So, you know, we've got to actually start to learn how to control the volume of capital in this country and not let so much volume of capital, so much money go into housing, while at the same time we don't put any money into manufacturing and being productive. Right? Because if we're going to get ahead in this country, we have got to stop relying on other countries. And as I say to people, if you got washed up on a desert island, would you either A, go to the bank uh, and, and, or try and manipulate interest rates? Uh, or, or get a, a credit, you know, Fitch's credit rating or something like that, or B, would you look to provide essential services to the people like dams, water, um, housing and, and productivity, right? Now, of course, you'd do the latter. 
And of course, we know that's exactly what happened in this country about uh, uh, 210 years ago uh, when Lachlan Macquarie came here. He was the first governor to see Australia as a country, not a colony. He realised in order to run a country properly, you've got to have your own currency. We don't really have our own currency today. We do in name. But what people don't realise is whenever we go to build a dam or anything like that, we use foreign currency. Which of course means that when you build a dam for a billion dollars and you've borrowed a billion dollars in foreign currency, the first billion dollars in wealth you create, you have to repay offshore. Now, what people don't understand is not all money printing is the same. If I'm a company and I want to become a bigger company, I can issue shares, equity, right? It's not called debt, it's called equity, right? Equity is title. As a sovereign country, we have title over this country. If I want to actually build a dam, I can issue shares in a dam. Right, that is productive. I don't need to borrow for it. Right? And all you need to do is get the RBA to lend a billion dollars to whichever state government is going to build the dam, and all they have to do is repay that debt. But I digress a little bit. But the reason why I talk about the RBA and this whole volume of money in the system is that we need to actually lower the cost of living as well. Right? And if we're going to lower the cost of living, rather than do what the RBA is doing, so we've currently had a supply shock because of Russia and all these other things, right? So what we've done, supply has gone down. What the RBA is going to do is try and crush demand as well by pushing it down. So they're going to use an austerity policy. That is complete and utter madness, right? What we need is a productivity policy that is going to increase supply. So rather than reduce demand and, and make people suffer through you know, not being able to rent a house or, or um, buy their own house, we need to increase productivity. We need to build. And if we build, and you'll get all the neoliberals and all these people who think they're economists, let me tell you, economists are to finance what climate modelists are to scientists. They rely on assumptions and false, false ideas, right? The idea that you know, uh, building uh, dams is going to cause inflation is a bad thing, is completely ridiculous. Because if you build more dams, you build more power stations, you build more roads, you build better transport infrastructure, you increase the supply. If you increase supply, you push the cost of essential services down. Okay, then you make it cheaper for business to actually operate. And then if you make it cheaper for business to operate, guess what? They employ more people. And if you employ more people and you're making more money, you can pay them more. And then they can afford to buy a house. And it becomes a virtuous circle. So uh, let me say that, look, while I can't agree with you entirely on the premise of keeping um, rental levels entirely flat, we do need to look at the way we run this country. Um, and we need to look at becoming much more productive, and we've got to stop all this paper shuffling uh, and pandering to uh, markets rather and start pandering to actually genuine productivity. That means less academics, more tradesmen. Uh, we need to get rid of payroll tax in this country by bringing back stamp duty on share trading. It is completely nuts that if I buy a house or I buy a farm or I buy a business or a truck, I've got to pay stamp duty, but yet I can flip shares all day on the stock market, and, and the stock market's manipulated by foreign investors. They pay no stamp duty, right? So, for, you know. So, um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Time's up, but yeah, that was good talk. Thank you. Thank you. You've still got one second. No, okay. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Norman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Housing is an essential service and a human right. Everyone has a right to safe, accessible and affordable housing. Yet in the midst of Australia's cost of living crisis, millions of Australians are struggling to make ends meet, while also paying ever higher, skyrocketing rents. We have seen the biggest annual rent increases in 14 years. The cost of rent is increasing seven times faster than wages. That's insane. It's crushing people. This is a housing crisis, and we know that the implementation of a nationwide rent freeze is essential. It will press pause on rent increases and allow wages time to catch up, and it will stop the profiteering by landlords becoming even worse. During this debate, we've heard about strategies for increasing the number of houses in this country, helping people into home ownership. But that is not going to help the family who can't afford their rent this week. And there are hundreds and hundreds of people across our country 
in that situation. This is a national emergency that we have parents and carers and families and children sleeping in cars, sleeping in tents, at risk of being evicted from their housing because the rent's been put up and they can't afford it, should be something that every single person in this place wants to move heaven and earth to fix today. That's why we need to freeze rents and it's why we need to cap increases to 2 per cent each year thereafter. We are currently undergoing one of the most significant transfers of wealth from non-property owners to property owners. It is deepening economic inequality in this country. Our current willingness to accept skyrocketing rental costs is creating a growing generational wealth divide as young people are forced to rent for longer at higher prices and at lower wages. Tenants are being saddled with the cost of increasing interest rates through these rent increases. A rent freeze is one of the most important things we could do to alleviate the cost of living pressures of Australians. Let's get it done. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. We are in a housing crisis. Australia is seeing the biggest rent increases in 14 years, putting millions of Australians into severe rental stress. And none are more affected than the millions of Australians who are forced by this Labor government to survive under the poverty line on grossly inadequate income support payments. I've heard from so many people who are struggling to keep a roof over their heads. One person who receives the disability support pension contacted my office to let me know they were evicted from their rental property of nine years because their landlord wanted to double the rent, and they couldn't do it while they were still in the property. This person is now homeless, staying in a caravan park with no heating. Someone else told me that their rent's just gone up by $60 a week, so it's now well over half their income. Once they pay the rent and their bills, they have $18 left over for food and all other items. They are forced to buy out-of-date food, they can't afford fresh fruit and vegetables, and their health is suffering because of it. Poverty is a political choice, and the gov this government is choosing to leave people without food or heating as they struggle to pay the rent. So just as the government coordinated a national response to the COVID-19 health crisis, the federal government should coordinate an emergency national response to the housing crisis, including an urgent rent freeze. The Greens are also fighting for all government income support payments to be lifted above the poverty line to ensure everyone has got enough to cover their basic needs. Our plan would raise all government income support payments above the poverty line. It would abolish mutual obligations and remove unfair restrictions on who can access payments to ensure that everyone has got enough to cover their basic needs. Don't let the government convince you otherwise. This is possible. I've said it once and I will say it again. Poverty is a political choice. So this government now has a choice. Labor could either work with the Greens, not go ahead with the stage three tax cuts and fund services to support everybody, or they could choose to side with Peter Dutton to funnel more money into the pockets of billionaires and the ultra-wealthy. It is a choice. Poverty is a political choice. We have the choice to end people living in poverty. We have a choice to institute a rent freeze that will help people survive. Poverty is a political choice, and we call upon this government to make the right choice. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you. Housing is a human right. Every single person in our community should be able to have a roof over their head, somewhere to call home, somewhere that is safe, somewhere that is affordable, somewhere where they can belong in a community. 
and making sure that every single community member is able to have a roof over their heads is one of the top priorities of the Australian Greens, and it should be a top priority of this government. Now, the reality of being a renter in Australia in 2022 is not something that we often hear in Parliament because, shock horror, there aren't too many renters that are elected members of Parliament. But let me just fill you in on what it is actually like to be a renter right now in Australia. One of my friends in Perth, they rent a house, right, for $500 a week. Now, this house in the summer is 40 degrees inside. And when this person contacted their landlord and said, hey, you've just put my rent up, could you please fit an air conditioning system? The response of the landlord was, the amount of money you're paying is commensurate for a house without an air conditioning system. No. They, another friend of mine uh, in uh, the lower south metropolitan part of Perth uh, spent one year arguing with their landlord whether or not their internet was functioning. They couldn't get online, they couldn't access government services at home, they couldn't socialise with their friends during lockdown. And every time they sent their landlord an email saying that this was a problem, the landlord responded that the telecommunication company had not registered a fault. And round and round it went for a year. Now, whether it is telecommunications, air conditioning, the leaky pipe in the back of the system that causes black mould to grow, whether it's the holes in the roof. People struggle in such deep insecurity, such absolute uncertainty, suffering such a profound power imbalance with their landlords that it causes incredible mental health uh, impacts upon people. You literally don't know whether this week is the week the landlord's going to evict, whether this week is the week that they're going to renovate and kick you out, or simply put your rent up so high that you cannot afford your home. And so that is why this government must follow the Greens' lead and institute a rent freeze, so that at the very least, People renting across this country can know what they're going to have to pay and know that it will be affordable for them so that they can keep that roof over their head. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to reject this motion in the strongest terms. Forcing a rent freeze will only make our housing crisis worse, not better. Don't get me wrong. I'm fully aware of the huge rent increases that have occurred since the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm fully aware that many Australian families are struggling with it. But freezing rents will only force more landlords out of the sector and further reduce the amount of accommodation available for rent. You need to address the underlying causes of this crisis. Lack of supply, in part driven by the fact we allow foreigners and multinationals to buy new residential property, actually stop all foreign ownership of any housing new or established. Massive and costly regulation imposed on landlords and high demand largely driven by the unsustainable flood of immigrants coming into this country as part of Labor's plan to outsource jobs that should go to Australians. State governments should release more land in a timely manner address costs and red tape, stamp duty revised. Most landlords are not wealthy property tycoons. In many cases, it supplements an otherwise meagre income. Many have spent all their lives making sacrifices to invest in a single property to make things a bit more comfortable in their retirement. Their costs are going up too, like council rates, insurance and interest rates. They have no control over these costs. If they cannot raise rents to accommodate these costs, they will leave the rental game and Australians will have even lower supply than before. Landlords are also tired of increasing regulation, which takes away the rights as property owners. These days, when a tenant moves in, they effectively become the owners. And if they become a problem, they can be impossible to remove in exchange for responsible tenants. Bonds worth six or six, four or six weeks rent are wholly, wholly inadequate to cover the cost of repairing property damage, wear and tear. Landlords, in some cases, can't even refuse tenants who own pets they don't want in their properties. Now the Greens want to take away another right. 
Are they completely ignorant of the short-term holiday accommodation market? Are they not aware of how much easier it is for property owners in this market than the rental market? Insurance costs are taken care of. Most stays are only for a day or a week, limiting the amount of wear and tear a landlord might need to fix. Property owners can make a lot more money from this market. A home that might attract $25,000 a year in rent can earn double that figure in the short-term holiday accommodation market without much of the regulatory burdens forced on landlords. I know the Greens mean well. I really do. With this idea, and I look forward to them freezing rents on their own investment properties, but don't impose your economic illiteracy on Australia. Thank you, Senator Hanson. The time for the debate has expired, so I'll put the question. The question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Cadell, teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 33. The question is resolved in the negative.